Welcome everybody um, back from lunch. So I'm really pleased to welcome today as our keynote speaker, Jolion Mom from the Good Law Project. The Good Law Project is a not-for-profit organization that campaigns on turning the law into a practical tool for positive change. And I feel that this is a really exciting opportunity for us to hear from Joe Mom, who is a, a barrister and a King's Counsel and the founder and director of the Good Law Project. They have been, uh, their, their work, that I, as far as I have been able to follow it, has been really exciting and important in challenging a whole host of issues that many of us are working on and interested in. So it's a real pleasure for me to Welcome, Joe. Also, I would like to mention that he has been, um, he's the author of a recent book, Bringing Down Goliath, How Good Law Can Topple the Powerful. So please join me in welcoming Joe. Thank you. And I'm going to speak on um, whose side is the law on. Um, I... Uh, and here one interposes one's own name, do swear by Almighty God, uh, uh, and I will well and truly serve our sovereign King Charles III in the office of, and here you insert the, the name of the judicial office to which you've been elevated, and I will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm without fear or favour, affection or ill will. I will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm without fear or favour, affection or ill will. That noble formula spoken on uh, becoming a judge expresses the thing that we crave in the law a uh, uh, wisdom of solomon resolution of the complexities of the human condition and unraveling of the contradictions and multitudes contained as what whitman would have it um all right uh, granted i'm laying it on a, a little thick there is no need to set the law on so high a pedestal in order to interrogate whether it delivers on the promises contained within that oath. Enough to ask whether it meets its basic promise of fairness without fear or favour. And as the title to this lecture, Whose Side Is The Law On, makes clear, I think the law does not. What I want to focus on this afternoon are four points. First, I'm going to make some observations about how the law is constructed to align it with, uh, as opposed to being in opposition to power. Second, I'm going to uh, make some points about the landscape in the United Kingdom that make that situation even worse. Points specific to our um, legal and cultural context. Third, I'll offer some evidence that the law is failing to meet its promise to do right to all manner of people without fear or favour. And finally, fourth, I'll suggest tentatively some improvements. So first, uh, the law is constructed to align it with power. The main sources of the law in the United Kingdom, as you will all know, are statute law, parliament-made law, if you like, and judge-made law. For a lawyer, statute law is how a party holding a majority in the House of Commons leaves its lasting stamp on the country. It's an articulation of the policy preferences and priorities of the government holding power. It's the most conspicuous way that a government enlists the power of the state to express its preferences to, as to how that society should look. Its will is written into the law books and can then be enforced by the state's power to confiscate property and coerce people through um, prison, if necessary. And it's also a thing that is backward-looking. The laws of the land are not cancelled on a change of government. And what this means is that the law is inherently small-c conservative. It's the accumulated policy preferences of those who now, or have previously, held power. Uh, I'm not making an observation at this stage about whether that's right or wrong. I I'm just pointing out um, that it is, unless you are or you have been in government, 
you've had no ability to make this form of law, and the law books reflect that. Um, our other source of law, uh, common law as described by lawyers at least, is made by judges, and it reflects how they understand the world. Judges are usually clever men. Fewer than a third of our senior judges are clever women. But their most singular quality is that they are privately educated. So a 2019 study by the Sutton Trust and the Social Mobility Commission called Elitist Britain showed that although only 7% of the population went to private schools, 65% of all senior judges do, and 71% of all senior judges um, went to Oxbridge compared with only 1%. Uh, of the population at large. Uh, they observe that no profession in Britain is less socially diverse than the judiciary. And it's a truism that fairness looks different to those who have grown up in communities where the pathways to highly paid professional positions are clearly mapped and well trodden to how it looks for those whose peers could not see a way out and amongst whom poverty, unemployment and criminality are a commonplace. I say it's a truism, it is a truism, but um, we need to wrestle nevertheless with its consequences. Uh, and I began this lecture with the judicial oath. Nothing in that oath transports judges to some higher spiritual plane, to some more enlightened state of being. And it's really important then to understand who our barristers are. What is the pool from which judges are drawn? I'll, I'll come back to that point. Um, there are lots of day-to-day -day examples of how um, those biases inherent in uh, who our judiciary is composed of play out. But I want to focus on one very fundamental one, um, the idea of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty is the idea that parliament is supreme and can make whatever laws it wants. It's sometimes described as the cornerstone of our constitution, although it might be better to describe it as the only fixed rule of our unwritten constitution. And it raises a very obvious question about how, if Parliament can do whatever it wants, fundamental rights, fundamental human rights, um, are protected. Tom Bingham, uh, to his friends, uh, Lord Bingham to, to, to us, um, was recently described in one obituary as the greatest judge of our time, arguably the most significant judicial figure among the long line of notables in the history of the Anglo-Saxon legal systems. Quite a, quite a line. And his legacy for the general reader is a book called The Rule of Law. And here's what that book says about parliamentary sovereignty. Critics of parliamentary sovereignty have no difficulty conceiving of flagrantly unjust and objectionable statutes to deprive Jews of their nationality, to prohibit Christians from marrying non-Christians, to dissolve marriages between blacks and whites, to confiscate the property of red-haired women, to require all blue-eyed babies to be killed, to deprive large sections of the population of the right to vote to authorise officials to inflict punishment for whatever reason they might choose. And then he adds a coda. No one thinks it at all likely that Parliament would enact legislation of this character or that the public would accept it if it did. And um, really it's that coda that I want to focus on. I would say that that coda, essentially that Parliament can be relied upon not to do awful things, speaks to a very particular understanding of how or perhaps more accurately, against whom Parliament has used its power through the ages. The description that um, Lord Bingham gives of what Parliament can be relied on not to do is hard to reconcile with your reality 
if your skin is black or brown in colour. It is hard to reconcile with parliamentary approval of, for example, the activities of the East India Company or Britain's treatment of enslaved peoples. And lest we think that this is some historical artefact, let us remember the expanded powers of the British Nationality Act, which give the government power to strip British citizenship from a Jew, even if, in the case of a Jew who acquired their citizenship through naturalisation, the effect would be to leave that person stateless. And more recently, our Parliament has said that people of colour let us not pretend that the Rwanda Act is about deporting white people, can be forcibly removed to a country we know not to be safe. If you are black, if you are brown, your experience will tell you that you ought to be less complacent about parliamentary sovereignty than was Lord Bingham. Now, I don't make these points to rain on his parade. He was, by all accounts, uh, a decent man, and the views he expressed in that passage that I quoted to you are entirely constitutionally orthodox. And all of us are constructed by our personal histories. I could have picked any one of numerous other constitutional grandees. But parliamentary sovereignty is a notion invented by judges who are even now, and it was certainly even more so in the past, grand, privately educated, wealthy, white English men, and it reflects their perception of who England is in the world, what it has done and to whom, and what it is likely in the future to do. And what it is very likely to do to people like them is different from what it is likely to do to a brown woman who has been trafficked to the United Kingdom for the purposes of sexual exploitation. She, the House of Commons, has recently decided, in pursuance of its parliamentary sovereignty, can be deported to a country that is not safe, namely Rwanda. The final feature of the law I want to point to is its expense. It has become routine for lawyers to cost thousands of pounds. Not thousands a week, or even thousands a day, but sometimes thousands an hour. And it is obvious, but too rarely said, that a tool that is too expensive for normal people to use becomes by definition a tool that only the wealthy can use. It is a tool that they will use to embed their interests, the interests of people with money. The law is a very different thing for those with the wealth or social capital to engage lawyers, to those who can afford King's Council, we are a very powerful private militia, to what it is for the overwhelming majority who cannot the orthodox response to this point is to say um, that there are lots of lawyers who will give their time for free to promote access to justice, and there are. The point is true so far as it goes, but it does not go very far, because the way our system allocates costs means that if you litigate and you lose, you will generally not always, but generally, pay the winner's costs. So even if you have lawyers acting for free, you can often not fight, because if you lose, you face enormous financial penalty, even bankruptcy. This critical feature of the law, um, the adverse cost regime, is a profound shortcoming in a thing whose main purpose is to be a safeguard, and is crafted by a committee, a civil procedure rules committee, who um, we looked at a couple of days ago, and we believe to be entirely white and overwhelmingly Oxbridge educated.
So I would point to these three features of the law that align it with power rather than fairness, the nature of statute law, the identity of our judges, and the nature of our costs regime. And I would describe the law as the victory dance of, of power, a very different description for that with which I began, that noble, stirring judicial oath. The second thing that I said that I was going to focus on this afternoon was some features of the legal and social landscape in the United Kingdom that make this situation even worse. The first is the limitless power of Parliament over judges. And I've touched upon this already. Lawyers call it the sovereignty of Parliament, and we've seen it most recently in the constitutional tussle over Rwanda. The Supreme Court looked at the evidence and said Rwanda is not safe, and Parliament responded with a statutory provision that said, we don't care, you have to treat it as safe when exercising your power as judges. You might think that parliamentary sovereignty, the supremacy of Parliament over the judiciary, is inevitable in a country that is a democracy. Who else can wield power but those elected by the people? Or some of the people at any rate. Um, we tend to forget that in 2005, Tony Blair won a very sizable majority with only 35% of the electorate voting for him. That's not 35% of the electorate overall, that's 35% of the electorate who voted, voted for the Labour Party. And nevertheless, our electoral system delivered to him a very sizable majority. You might think that it is inevitable, but it is not inevitable. Other democracies find ways to distribute democratic power over temporally different electorates. They elect representatives in tranches rather than all at once. They have multiple elected houses, each of which can clog the other and which are also elected at different times. They have an elected head of state who has his or her own democratic legitimacy. And most of all, they have a higher law which safeguards fundamental rights in which it takes a supermajority of the electorate or its representatives to change. But what we have is what Lord Hailsham famously described as an elective dictatorship. The only real power belongs to the House of Commons. And the Lords, as we have also learned from the Rwanda Act, um, eventually gives way. This feature, which is certainly the dominant feature of the cultural landscape in England and Wales, less clearly in Scotland that has its own legal system, is judge-made. Judges made it, it didn't come from anywhere else. Uh, we have no written constitution, no higher rule to define or restrain the power wielded by a government. So although we talk about the separation of the powers, constructing the executive and parliament and judiciary as independent and counterbalancing sources of power, our reality is very different. Parliament can do what it wants. In the early years of its life, Good Law Project brought um, a number of cases. We raised money from tens of thousands of people to litigate cases in our own name. We were, if you like, a legal trade union. We enabled normal people who could not afford to wield the law alone to wield it together. Good Law Project versus the government was the new in rear company. Uh, an excellent, if inside, baseball joke made by one of the senior judges here in cases against the government. But everything changed in the summer of 2022. Since the summer of 2022, we have only been allowed to litigate in our own name once, and that was a case in a very particular regime with very particular rules. What happened in the summer of 2020, 2022? What happened was a series of attacks on us in the press, culminating with a very explicit threat made to the judiciary by Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister. 
I have the greatest respect for our judiciary and the rule of law in this country, wrote Rishi Sunak in an August 2022 press release. He then went on to threaten new legislation to force judges to do his bidding, uh, and here I quote the press release, which he would activate in the event of judicial recidivism. Um, a quite extraordinary word to use of our judges. And he said he would not need the consent of Parliament to do it. That press release, for good measure, went on to attack me by name ten times. I was mentioned ten times by name in that press release, in case the first nine did not do the job. And since then, save for only one case in that special regime, we have not been allowed to litigate. And the question that I pose um, rhetorically, although um, uh, you can answer it um, in the Q&A session at the end of this lecture, is would this have happened if the independence of the judiciary were protected by a higher law? so that Rishi Sunak could not issue that threat and expect to be taken seriously. The reality, I would suggest to you, is that because the independence of the judiciary is not protected by a higher law, there is no need for Sunak to legislate to stop judges interfering, as he would describe it. When the Israeli government threatened the independence of its judges, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets. When the Hungarian government threatened the independence of its judiciary, the EU threatened it with sanctions. But the absence of a higher law in the United Kingdom enables the government to interfere with the judiciary in private, behind closed doors, and without sanction. It would be an oversimplification to say that judges can be obliged to do what government wants, but they can certainly be lent on. You will struggle to find a single senior public lawyer who, speaking privately, would take issue with the proposition that government has successfully tilted the playing field against those who want to use the law to hold government to account. I was told a year or so ago of a prominent Court of Appeal judge, I know his name, who has been saying that claimants are going to lose a lot of cases because judges want to conserve their power in case of another prorogation type event, another direct attack on democracy. Claimants are going to lose a lot of cases, and you can see this very clearly in the, the data. You can see very clearly in the data that there has been a broad spectrum collapse in success rates of litigation against the government. Has this government, famously characterised as we're breaking fucking international law like it's one of our five a day, suddenly become hugely law-abiding? Or have judges moved the goalposts under political pressure? Another rhetorical question. Uh, and this, the absence of proper legal protection for judges from bullying ministers, is a subtle feature of the constitutional landscape that aligns the law with government power. Different judges have different approaches to the relationship between themselves and the government. There's nothing sinister in the fact of these differences. They might reflect different philosophies, which are certainly to be found amongst legal academics. And they might also reflect different experiences. So some senior administrative court judges worked almost exclusively for the government before becoming judges, and others worked almost exclusively against it. And it would be surprising if their personal histories aren't reflected in how um, they perform the business of judging. Um, but although there is nothing sinister in the fact of these differences, one can't sensibly deny that they exist. 
I was a King's Council, notionally I am still a King's Council, and I am now through Good Law Project one of the biggest buyers of the services of public law barristers. So I know very well, having been on both sides of the table, payee and payer if you like, that lawyers are always interested in who their judges are and they always tell their clients and sometimes, not always, but sometimes they have very strong views. Sometimes as a lawyer you believe you know that a difficult case just became impossible or a simple case got easier once you see who the case is to be heard before. What is troubling is the belief that judicial review cases which carry enhanced political risk for the government are placed before judges whose way of looking at the world is politically convenient. In other words, the belief that sometimes politically sensitive cases are decided by hand-picking the judge who is to hear that case. There is a very widespread perception that this happens. In one very high-profile case of ours, the defendant was Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings was also implicated. We won at first instance, but on appeal we lost. This was a profound surprise to everybody, certainly it was to our lawyers, and it also seemed, because they didn't appeal until after the deadline, it was almost an afterthought, to the government's lawyers. And after the result of the decision in the Court of Appeal came out, I was contacted by a High Court judge who said to me, on email, I still have the email, quote, you managed to pick three Tories in the Court of Appeal, or rather, Burnett did. Ian Burnett was then the Lord Chief Justice, and that role of Lord Chief Justice is where the political rubber, if you like, hits the legal road. The Lord Chief Justice is appointed by the Lord Chancellor, who is of course a minister, indeed a senior cabinet minister. Under the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005, the Lord Chancellor can, but does not need to, consult anyone else before making the appointment. So the Lord Chancellor can, if so minded, make a political appointment when choosing the Lord Chief Justice. And under that same act, the Lord Chief Justice, and I quote, is responsible for the maintenance of appropriate arrangements for the deployment of the judiciary of England and Wales and the allocation of work within courts. So that judge um, uh, who can be a political appointee can decide who hears cases. That is one of their duties under the Constitutional Reform Act of 2005. And what I can say is that government-leaning judges are believed within the profession to be allocated to politically sensitive cases, and I can say that it is clearly constitutionally possible for that, that to happen. I've just pointed to the provision of the uh, Constitutional Reform Act. And I can also say that Ian Burnett was a member of the Carlton Club, which is often described as the home of the Conservative Party. I should say also, though, that um, I have no direct evidence that what the law clearly permits and insiders believed to happen does actually happen. I do not know that the High Court judge who sent me that email was right, and I should say they have since claimed that they were just joking, uh, a point they made when I asked whether I could um, attribute the email to them in my book. And I don't think that the data points about Ian Burnett that I've referred to are anything like conclusive evidence that he did um, what a fellow judge on the bench said that he had done. I also know that privately judges, even judges who are sympathetic to the work that we do, speak highly of him. But what I can say is that the perception of politically motivated listing uh, listing of cases before um, judges is widely held and the Constitutional Reform Act in plain sight does give to the holder of the most political of judicial appointments the power to decide who should hear cases. Third point that I was going to deal with this afternoon was to offer some evidence that the law is failing to meet its promise of fairness. 
much of what I have said already is heretical for a lawyer to say, or perhaps it would be more accurate to say it is heretical for a lawyer to say it in public, because certainly we say it to one another. When I have talked publicly about perceptions of individual judges, I've been criticised by my peers, even by those of my peers who I would think of as enlightened. Their point is that it is wrong to say this stuff publicly, even though, of course, we talk about it privately, because to say it publicly is to undermine public confidence in the administration of justice. And it's that notion, the importance of not undermining public confidence in the administration of justice, that I want to just rest with for, for the next few minutes. That notion is an idea heavily embedded in the regulatory superstructure of the profession. It is, for example, an explicitly stated outcome sought by my professional conduct rules um, as a barrister. And we all understand that it is important. The rule of law functions best when the limits of its authority are not tested, when the public has confidence in it. It's a little bit like being a parent. Um, but I do think a blind prioritization of promoting confidence in the rule of law is dangerous and misguided. And the amerta on examining whether the law delivers on its promise of doing right to all manner of people without fear or favour might actually ensure that the law does not, does not deliver on that promise. It might mean it, the law, serves privilege rather than fairness. When we see or experience racism in the police force, our confidence in the police declines. If our concern is for public confidence in the law, we should ask people who might have experiences of the law different from our own whether they have confidence in it. We will build more confidence in the judiciary by interrogating how it works and what it does rather than by drawing a veil over those matters. In pursuance of that idea, Good Law Project asked people from all of the minoritized groups protected by the Equality Act what they thought about the administration of justice. We commissioned very detailed polling from YouGov, which showed that, for example, people of color do have lower levels of trust in judges. When asked, how much, if at all, do you trust judges, 65% of the general population, including people of color, said a lot or a fair amount. That figure fell to 61% for black, Asian, and minority ethnic adults, and to only 47% or 50% for Pakistani and Bangladeshi people, respectively, albeit that was a fairly small cohort. The only group that had less confidence in the judiciary was trans people uh, at 46%, and 40% of all trans people said their confidence in the judiciary had fallen. What was true of people of colour was universally true of all of those minoritised groups. So the data showed, without exception, that the closer you looked to an archetypal judge, the higher the degree of confidence you had in judges and the rule of law. Those from higher social classes had more confidence than lower. Older people had more confidence than younger. White people had more confidence than people of colour. Straight people had more confidence than gay. Able-bodied people had more confidence than disabled. And cis people had more confidence than trans. And there's another strange thing too. Um, it's possible that I've missed it, but I'm not aware of any previous detailed polling on trust in the judiciary across minoritized groups. And that is a striking omission, given the importance that the legal profession attaches, or says it attaches, to upholding public competence in the law. Is public confidence really the concern? If it was, wouldn't you want to know whether people actually had confidence in the judicial system? And if some did, 
and if some did not, wouldn't you want to understand why? But no previous polling that we've been able to find. Of course, many of these relative levels of confidence exist in relation to other institutions too. My point is not that these differing levels of confidence are unique to the law. My point is that lawyers' attitudes to them, that they shall not be acknowledged or spoken of, is unique. What is really being contended for by those who say you must not criticise judges, you must not undermine public confidence in them? It seems to me that if the concern really was to protect competence in judges, um, would people not be asking why it is that society's winners have confidence? Perhaps the true concern revealed by this silencing is that things are working well for people who look like judges. Perhaps that is the real concern, to maintain a status quo um, through that a matter on interrogating the inherent biases within our legal system. Just by the by, another important question is, why is public confidence in the rule of law given an elevated importance? For sure it has value, but is it more important than the law actually working fairly? If a thing is broken or damaged, is it right to encourage people to have confidence in it? And how is it that you really ensure confidence in judges and the law? Do you do it by protecting them from criticism, or do you do it through careful, responsible interrogation? Most lawyers, if asked to comment on any other feature of society, would say that the best way to keep things honest and functioning properly is through respectful, careful scrutiny and interrogation. And the point is obvious, if that is true of everything else, why is it wrong of justice and judges? I want to briefly share a postscript to that YouGov poll. As I said, the group that had the lowest confidence in the judiciary was trans people. Only 46% had confidence. Uh, and as I've mentioned, a staggering 40% of trans people said their confidence levels had fallen. Causation isn't correlation. But it is striking that when judges decide issues which have a profound effect on the lives of trans people, they themselves are often not in the room. Indeed, it has sometimes been bolted shut to them. One of the guiding principles of the conduct of justice is that you should hear from those who are affected. But in the signal case of our times for trans people, the Bell case, the divisional court, hearing that case at first instance, refused permission for mermaids, a charity that represents young trans people, to intervene. It refused permission for Stonewall, undoubtedly the country's leading LGBT plus charity, to intervene. And having initially allowed an intervention from a trans child acting through their parents, it then changed its mind and forbade that intervention as well. But it did allow an intervention from an anti-trans pressure group, Transgender Trend, which was not affected by the case and had no recognised professional expertise in treatment protocols for trans children. The decision of the Divisional Court was an appalling one, as was the conduct of the case by the judges in question. Speaking as a lawyer, and I'm not here commenting on its outcome, I can't think of a worse decision in recent times, and I said that before that decision was overturned by the Court of Appeal. We've come to think of minoritised groups, including um, lawyers, as unable to participate in decisions affecting their lives, often because they are, in inverted commas, self-interested. They can't be a judge in their own cause. They can't argue independently. And for myself, I wonder um, quite a lot about where that line of thinking leads us. What does it mean for the bodily autonomy of women? Who will get to decide on those questions? If groups are excluded from the room when decisions are made about their lives, 
Is it any surprise that they have little trust or confidence in the outcomes that process from which they are excluded delivers? That is the law failing to meet its promise of fairness. That is the law deserving, I would say, the lack of confidence its practice has generated. And I would say that it is right rather than wrong to make those points. Finally, fourth, I want briefly to finish with some ideas about how we might make things better. Despite all I have said, um, it's not my intention to be too apocalyptic about this. My uninformed guess is that relative to national peers, our legal system is second or third quartile in terms of how it operates. Certainly not awful, but absolutely not as good as we kid ourselves it is. And there is ample room, and I would say ample possibility for it to improve. So three very specific suggestions. First, the rule that the loser pays the winner's costs is much too rigid. The rule exists for good reason. Without it, litigation can be used to deprive people of their legal rights. If you're forced to sue to recover money that you are owed, and you cannot reclaim the costs of suing, then the law does not deliver justice. Ditto, if you are forced to defend a hopeless lawsuit, and you cannot recover the costs of your defence, your pursuer can use litigation to harm you, even if the law is not on their side. But if the rule is applied too rigidly, it can also mean that justice is avoided rather than being done. If I cannot afford the risk of defending myself against a rapist who threatens to sue me unless I apologise for naming him, that does not serve justice. If I cannot afford to assert my legal rights because of the risks of losing, they are not except in some abstracted theoretical sense my rights at all. Now, a precise resolution of those tensions is not for today, but um, the point I want to make today is that um, recognising that there are tensions to resolve is something um, we really need to wrestle with if we're interested in justice. The second um, tentative suggestion is that we take an interest in the outcomes that judges deliver. The power that the judiciary has is such that even if it was your heartfelt belief that taken as a whole, the body of judges is uniquely blessed with kindliness, wisdom, equanimity, even then you might still think it wise systematically to monitor what they, the judges, do just to you know, just, just to be sure, the law requires large employers to produce and then publish their gender pay gaps. It does this in part to pose questions to employers about why their figures look like they do. Perhaps there are good and satisfactory answers. But without the production of the data, they might never think to ask. And the publication of the data serves another purpose too. It enables employees to interrogate the system. There is no reason why we should not produce equivalent data for judges. Sometimes the data will only serve the purpose of asking questions about outlier judges. If the data shows that a particular judge is more likely to arrive at a particular outcome than their judicial colleagues, shouldn't they know? Might it help them gain awareness of the possibility of biases in their conduct? Might that data form part of the interrogation of whether they should be promoted up the judicial ladder? Kick their tyres and well-worn aphorisms about the law often reveal themselves to be expressions of what Gramsci would have called the cultural hegemony. They are part of the way in which those with power hold it to themselves and to their benefit. They amply justify the acid observation of the political theorist and philosopher Judith Schlar that the rule of law has, and here I quote, 
become just another one of those self-congratulatory rhetorical devices that grace the public utterances of Anglo-American politicians. No intellectual effort need therefore be wasted on this bit of ruling class chatter. I was thinking about this lecture before I gave it and wondering whether it was too strong. And then I read Judith Schlar and I wondered if it was too weak. <laughs> Those, and I number myself amongst them, who would like to fend off that powerful criticism do so best by muscular engagement with what the law and judges do and how and why rather than an intellectually demeaning mixture of Victorian paternalism and thoughtless indignation. If the conduct of the law is to remain more than empty performance of lawyers' collective sense of virtue, I would say these questions cannot be dodged. My final point is this. We have our share of virtues, us barristers, but qualifying as a barrister is expensive, and we do tend towards the privileged, and we do tend towards the conservative. And judges are overwhelmingly drawn from the ranks of barristers, and if as a barrister you want to become a judge, you know that your interests are best served by keeping your head down. So, judges are the most conservative members of a conservative profession, not a class taken as a whole, well equipped to interrogate thoughtfully its own privilege. We are not diverse in other ways either. In England and Wales, there are 1,417 salaried judges those who have decided to become a judge permanently. Of those 1,417, the number who are black or black British is 11. This is actually quite a big jump from when I last checked three or four years ago, when the equivalent number was four. But you do not need me to tell you it remains very poor. And after the departure of Victoria MacLeod, I don't think there is a single salary judge in the UK who is trans. Certainly there is none who is out. If we want people to have confidence in the law, and we say we do, and if we want the law to deserve the confidence we invite people to repose in it, I think we need to return to an idea Sadiq Khan pushed when he was Shadow Justice Minister in 2014 of quotas. So just by way of conclusion, we need to revisit our cost rules to ensure that they serve justice, not money. We need to monitor what judges do. They do not live on some higher moral plane. They are prone to the same biases as everyone else. And we need to care more about who our judges are. We need to do more than rend our cheeks and wail about the deplorable state of judicial diversity we need concrete steps to fix the problem. Thank you. We have some time for... We do have some time for Q&A, for comments, reflections as well. So, as you know, this is the... Social School of Social Sciences, so we have perhaps not so many legal questions, but more critical questions, and I'd be really pleased to welcome questions, both from in the room, but also online, of course. I know that colleagues might wish to... I'm very, very questions. keen that we had take a first question from a, from a woman, um, if possible. Um, <laughs> Okay. But if not, I'll, I'll make do with second best, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for your thoughtful uh, uh, talk. Um, so, uh, based on, on, on your criticism, um, you criticize the law as a, uh, as a big regard of, uh, of power. I'm tempted to ask, would you say then that the law, uh, in a number of respects, is, is more than banker? And if that's the case, then is someone 
the same government justify to disobey the, the law in, in certain cases. So have in mind, for example, those climate change protesters, right? Those people who come not from a legal right perspective, but those who come from a moral right perspective. Um, uh, it goes, I would say, much too far to describe the law as morally bankrupt. Um, and the um, vigour with which I advance my criticisms of how the law is on the side of power um, reflect, I think, the isolated nature of my voice on these issues in the legal community, as well as um, the importance of the criticisms. Um, but I do think that there is this further feature of the legal landscape um, that is not sufficiently um, interrogated or understood. Lawyers are very, very powerful gatekeepers. The law is, to those who do not practice it, a fairly arcane instrument. Uh, so we gatekeep outsiders. Um, and we are vigorous in our criticism of um, flawed analysis by outsiders. And we're pretty good at vigorous criticism. We're communicators, uh, barristers at any rate. Um, and, um, and perhaps this is not something that is unique to the law, um, although it is certainly a feature of the law. Uh, and really, this is uh, the point of my lecture. We're not sufficiently thoughtful uh, about what the institution we only allow ourselves to interrogate does uh, and, and what it means and how it operates um, and what the um, truth is of the comforting stories we tell ourselves, um, including in the judicial oath with which um, I began. Um, you know, we do have to wrestle with this stuff. I was, I think I was in the Daily Mail six days in a row when I broke the cab rank rule and said that I wasn't going to act against climate change protesters. I wasn't going to act against, uh, I wasn't going to act for those building new fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, that was a breach of my professional code of conduct. Um, but I think that sometimes uh, the law is wrong, and it is wrong to uphold it. I hope I would have done the same um, when our law permitted um, the holding as possessions of human beings. Thank you. <clears throat> we have a question online from Jane. Uh, Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, my question concerns the jury system. So re regarding the confidence that's often expressed in the jury system, but also now the concerns of the defend our juries, um, is it a surprise that the decision in favour of Trudy Warner is now being challenged on appeal? Uh, and my comment comes as a Quaker myself. This does feel like an attempt to overturn a major principle of the legal system that's been established since the 17th century, as literally written in stone in the back of the old baby. <coughs> so the background to this, thank you, Jane, for that um, excellent question, is um, that climate change protesters have been electing where they can for trial by jury. And um, they have sought to place before juries their reasoning for protesting. And when they have placed before juries their reasoning for protesting, they have very often been acquitted. And judges haven't liked this very much, or at least some judges haven't liked this very much, and have sought to stop, and indeed 
in the criminal justice bill, um, the government has made this easier. Those um, charged with being tried with climate change offences from telling the jury why they protested um, so as to uh, remove the possibility of juries acquitting um, or at least to minimise that possibility. Uh, we need to remember that juries exist as a, um, a valve, if you like, against the most powerful um, exercise of state power against an individual that there is, the power to, to lock somebody up, to deprive them of their, their liberty. Um, and the function of juries, um, well recognised, is to um, test through um, 12 people good and true um, the justice of steps that a mighty executive takes against individuals. Uh, and Trudy Warner believes that um, this is a thing that is wrong, that juries really do need to be able to exercise that important function. And she held a sign up outside um, the High Court reminding juries that they have an absolute right to acquit. Um, and I've spoken uh, with Trudy on a number of occasions, and Good Law Project has been helping her with her defence, and I'm very, very proud of that work that we do. Um, she was uh, threatened with contempt of court proceedings by the Attorney General, a very, very serious offence. Um, the judge decided that the facts did not disclose a possible contempt of court, um, and the government has appealed, we learnt yesterday, uh, against that decision. Uh, I mean, if I um, put aside um, my sympathy for climate change protesters, and if I put aside um, my sympathy for Trudy Warner, both difficult things to do, but, but let me try, um, where I'm left is um, that this is an action of a piece with lots of other actions that are constraining the democratic process, constraining our ability to participate in uh, what I would describe as normal democratic life, um, turning, if you like, democracy from a process to an event that happens um, every five years. Um, I, I see it um, in that setting, um, and it is a troubling piece of evidence, but it is um, only one of a number of pieces of, of troubling evidence. Um, if you forgive me, let me just make one more point. Um, it's hard living in a country um, to understand whether that which you see around you is cause for serious concern. It's hard um, because uh, all of the institutions of the state um, and the, the various estates of power um, carry on as normal. And so you wonder to yourself, is this bad or am I paranoid? And I would say that there is very, very good evidence that this is bad and you are not paranoid in the form of the very lively debate about whether we should leave the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, a, a convention um, that Churchill was uh, amongst the promoters of, um, that we have been members of for many, many decades, and that only two countries have felt unable to bear the chafe of Greece after a right-wing military coup and Russia after invading Ukraine. That is not enviable company to be in, and I think that is quite good objective evidence of the dangerous state of our politics. Thank you so much.
was there one more question? Or no, okay. Well, last question, maybe make it short. Yeah, it won't be short. So it's I'm my fault, I think, rather than the question was short. Uh, I suspect either work is going on, on, on this, or this sentence is already there, but um, he talks about kind of biases and judges' performance. Is there evidence to show the sort of relationship between judges' membership of, you know, men only elite clubs with, with their performance and biases, potential biases in their performance? Um, there's not um, what um, you as academics would describe as evidence. Um, what there is is um, powerful anecdote, I guess. So um, one of the campaigners I'm very proud to work with is uh, a woman called Dr. Charlotte Proudman. Um, she's really been at the forefront of um, taking on um, membership of the Garrett Club. She's secured a number of recusals from um, cases involving the rights of women um, of judges who belong to a club that hitherto at least has excluded women. Um, and if she were here, I'm hesitant to speak for Charlotte, but if she were here, I think she would say um, that she can see striking correlations between membership of um, the Garrett Club and attitudes to women more generally. Um, for myself, I think I'd probably have um, a slightly different analysis. Um, I would say that um, membership of the Garrick Club probably evidences um, a lack of thoughtfulness um, about who you are and what privileges you carry. And it is that lack of thoughtfulness uh, about um, the universality of your own personal experience that damages your ability to be a good judge. Um, but although um, we take different roads, uh, Dr. Proudman and I both end up in Rome, if you like. Great, thank you so much. I want to just read out one of the comments from Sophie Grace. Um, many thanks to, to Jomo for this wonderful and both restoring lecture. And I have to say, thank you so much just to, and to that, thank you for